Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. We're gonna switch things up just a little bit. I'm bringing back the birthday shout outs, but I will not be doing that before I start reading the stories. If you would like your birthday announced on Back to Ashes, please go over to the post on the community tab and list what day your birthday is on. Any birthdays posted down in the comments of these stories, they are too hard to keep up with as the channel is growing larger. So please head over to the community tab and let me know your birthday. At the end of the video, I will give everyone their birthday shout out. If you would like to learn how to become a member of Back to Ashes or would like to buy me a copy as a special thank you, all of that information can be found down below. If you are new here and enjoy what you are hearing or have been here and haven't done so just yet, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Entwined Horror Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play. After that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is just as the title suggests, all kinds of stories mushed into one. If you have not seen my community tab post about what's coming on Sundays, please head over there to find out. Let's get you some vocal melatonin, shall we? Okay guys, so I grew up in a house built in 1860 in upstate New York with zero problems. We bought this fixer-upper house here in Virginia, built in the 80s, right before COVID. And let me tell you, I love scary stories, but have never encountered so many creepy things as I have in this house. First of all, two years ago, I was nursing my son at about 2 a.m. in our bed. My boyfriend always seemed to wake up with me and the baby during his infant days and would just keep us company on his phone while our son ate. We were both very awake this night, just chatting a little, and the dogs were sleeping in the living room. Suddenly, we hear the dog's feet on the wood floor and excited panting. Mind you, these are dogs who usually bark if someone enters the house. Who doesn't live there? Then... We both hear a man's voice mumbling in our kitchen, as if he is greeting our dogs. My boyfriend looks at me shocked and then springs up to check as I am petrified. He sees nothing in the entire house. The next occurrence happens a few months later. I am alone in our large bedroom, just putting things away and tidying up before getting into bed. As I turn off the light switch, my boyfriend walks into the room. So he passed right by me. I didn't look straight at him, but I greeted him while turning down the covers. No answer. Still sidetracked with plugging in my phone and such, I ask him if he is going to bed as he was over on his side of the bed just standing. No answer. I still wasn't looking at him. He likes to joke around with me, so I straight up ask, Are you mad at me or fucking with me right now? As I finally look up, he ducks down by his side of the bed, and I seriously just thought he was picking up some shit our son had thrown down there or something. I asked the same question again, and then my actual live boyfriend walks into the room and goes, Who are you talking to? I had chills over every inch of my body, and he just shook his head like, You're nuts, girl. Since then, there's been a few smaller things that have happened. My son's toys went off in the living room once, with nobody around them, mind you. And one morning, my boyfriend came home from night shift, and our laundry basket was in the middle of the kitchen. He thought I had moved it there before bed, but I assured him I had no reason to. The reason I'm writing this now is I was just cooking in the kitchen and heard whistling behind me. And earlier today, I heard a human adult cough upstairs. I'm fucking freaked out right now, especially with my boyfriend working night. Any feedback or suggestions would truly help.
So I work at a multi-billion dollar retail chain, and besides my main other department, which is also in the back room, there is a second department I'm cross-trained in that I work in for a couple of hours each morning, and every Saturday accepting deliveries. Now, I'm of average build, not overweight, but not as slender as I used to be. I have kids, so I have a bit of a mommy tummy that I've fought to get rid of for years. I think I look average, to be honest, but used to get a lot of attention back in the day from young men. Around when I was in my 20s, I'm now in my mid-30s, and though I look younger, it's not by as much as it used to be. These days, the only guys eyeing me are 10 plus years older than me and, yeah, usually not attractive either. I'm married and not looking for a replacement either. I love my husband. There's a good variety of delivery drivers who deliver to my store, and I know many of my regulars by name. Every now and then, there's a new driver or a substitute driver for one of the companies, but for the most part, it's the same people. So there's a regular driver who comes in every Saturday to deliver milk. We'll call him Mike. He's mid-50s and nearing retirement age for the company he works for. He's friendly and cheerful and always greets everyone happily. He also loves making jokes. He even does the shave and a haircut two bits knock on our bay door when he arrives. I've always thought he was pretty cool and even said that he was my favorite delivery driver since he's so nice. I think he may have gotten the wrong idea though. When I first started there, the other lady who used to substitute in that department warned me that Mike was a terrible flirt and that he liked to try to get with all of the ladies. I kind of shrugged it off. I didn't know it was a big deal. Over the past year, he said that I'm his favorite receiving person and, of course, that I'm beautiful. He has been very flirty and even asked me out on lunch dates. I have also declined and told him that I am married. This hasn't deterred him in the least. He could care less about that. Mike has gotten friendly enough to even show me pictures and videos of trips he's been on and what not. Last week, he showed me a video of the drive up his driveway and views around his 300 acres of land. I thought that it was rather odd, though. I mean, why show someone your driveway all of a sudden and show off your land? What was his goal with this? He's started calling me a nickname recently, too which no one had ever really called me, as it was something only my creeper dad ever called me. Even my husband knows to steer clear of that nickname, because it triggers me. It's an obvious nickname for my name, and no one uses it. Kinda like Mike is a nickname for Michael, or Kate for Caitlin. Well, yesterday, just before he left, he said something I was not expecting. Mike asked me if he could shrink wrap me and take me with him. I gave him a firm and immediate, uh, no. This immediately made me think of a murder that happened in my area before I moved out here, where a woman was saran wrapped by her boyfriend and dumped naked and saran wrapped on the side of the highway. The police were never able to connect the guy to the murder, though. The locals knew he had to be one of who did it, but... I was told he left the area after that. The more I think of this question, the more creeped out I get. I wonder if I should report it to management or just tell them to cut that crap out the next time I see him as a warning. My company prefers people to tell harassers to stop before reporting an issue, but I'm not sure if this falls into that category or is creepy enough to be something I should just report right away. What do you guys think? All I know is I'm really uncomfortable having to see him again next Saturday when he delivers again. Here's an update. I took my manager aside and told her about the situation and she agreed that it definitely was not appropriate and that she wants a written statement from me on the matter. So we'll see how it's handled. If he stops delivering to my store or stops being creepy, I'll know it's been handled properly. Update number two. I talked to my assistant manager on Friday, 
and she said that it was being handled by ethics, so not at the store level. I told her I was thinking of having a supervisor shadow me while the guy was here on Saturdays. Saturday morning came, though, and I felt like crap and really did not want to have to deal with him on top of already feeling tired, so I just called out. Some poor support manager had to deal with him instead. I don't know how long it will take them to address the issue, but I hope it's soon. Update number three. So, my case is back to being investigated at store level again. Did the statement and answered questions and whatever. Won't know anything for a while, I'm guessing. Asking for any guarantees that they could keep me safe, none were given. They just said they're looking into it, and that if I have any further issues, to notify them. <laughs> oh yeah, that makes me feel so much safer. Totally. Lastly, update number four. Today I was anxious to go to work, as I know it's the day that creepy guy delivers milk. The closer it got to 7.30 a.m., the more nervous I got. Just before 7.30 a.m., I went down to my other work area on the opposite side of the back room. It's a huge store, so it's approximately 600 feet away or so. When I got down there, I discovered that my supervisor wasn't there, as I had feared and my anxiety only grew. When I got back to my area, there were only a few merchandisers milling about, loading up their products onto carts and whatnot. I didn't see any other managers, including the one I had spoken to earlier in the day, to confirm that he would be present and nearby to give me some sense of security. In a moment of desperation, I thought back to what my coworker had told me just yesterday, and that was to ask a female coworker to stay with me and look out for me. So I asked one and she said yes. We waited in the back room, distracting ourselves with meaningless tasks to pass the time. Before I knew it, a half hour went by, then an hour, and then another half hour. No milk. I went to lunch and thanked my coworker for humoring me and staying nearby. After lunch, I checked to see if the milk ever came. But it hadn't. I was pretty happy I didn't have to see him for another week at least. Then later, I was pulled into the office at the end of my shift. The manager then told me that as of today, that man, Mike, is no longer permitted in our store. He can't deliver there or even shop there. So now they have to rearrange our delivery schedule for milk. But I honestly was just so relieved. I told the manager that I felt very relieved and thanked him for letting me know. It's like a weight has finally been lifted off my chest. So, creepy delivery guy that used to deliver milk at my store. May we never meet again. It's the mid-90s. I went on a road trip with my son and for some stupid reason decided to take a different route home than the one I had taken previously and was familiar with. Turned out the new route was a super desolate road. I specifically chose to drive in the middle of the night so my son would be sleeping and there'd be less traffic. It's probably 3 a.m. and of course my piece of shit car breaks down. By some luck of the draw, I'm almost right in front of an abandoned roadside market and was able to coast into the parking lot. The windows are all boarded up on the market. Steam is pouring out from under my hood, and it was essentially the start to every single dumb chick breaks down in the middle of nowhere and gets hacked to death movie you've ever seen. All of a sudden, I see the headlights coming around the bend. I'd been driving on this road for a couple of hours and had seen maybe two other vehicles the whole time. A truck driver passed, slows down, and then I see the reverse lights come on in my rearview mirror. Deliverance banjo music starts to play in my head. The truck pulls up, so our vehicles are driver window to driver window, and I see the driver is an older man, and he's just staring at me. He looks like the stereotypical serial killer you would visualize. 
Long, scraggly gray hair, grizzled stubble, sort of crazy eyes. He motions for me to roll down my window. I'm just trying to look anywhere but directly at him and acting like I don't see him. And everything's fine and dandy. But oh no, I'm not in any distress. Please ignore the steam coming from my car. <laughs> I'm good. Thanks anyway. He backs up a little, parks and get out of his truck and starts walking towards my car. I'm thinking this is where my son and I end up a news story about bodies being found in the boonies when the snow melts and he starts yelling, I'm not going to hurt you. Roll down your window. I keep looking anywhere but at him while trying to give off a strong you don't want to fuck with me vibes. In reality, I'm about shedding my pants. He gives me a disgusted look, walks to his truck, and starts digging around. He comes walking back with his tools in his hands, and now I'm thinking, Oh my god, he's got tools. He's gonna kill me and bust out my teeth and cut my fingers off, so I can't be identified. Shit! He yells, Open the hood, please. I'm looking everywhere but at him. Open the hood, let's see what's wrong. He's pissed. I'm scared shitless. But I reach down and pop the hood. He opens it, and I crouch down so I can see him through the couple of inches where the hood is open. He looks up, and we make eye contact, and I about die. He looks down and keeps doing whatever it is he's doing. He goes back and forth between his truck and my car a couple more times, bringing more tools. Some jug of something and other things I can't make out. After about 15 minutes, he closes my hood and yells at me to start it up. My car sputters a little, turns over, and then seems fine. He yells, Be careful, there are lots of weirdos out here. Gets in his truck, gives me one last disgusted look, and drives off. My car made it home. My dad looked it over after I told him the story and deducted that the guy had changed a radiator hose. My dad pointed out many times that the chances of me being struck by lightning were probably better than my chances of some random guy in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, happened to be driving around with a radiator hose and the tools to replace it for whatever 10 plus year old piece of shit foreign car I'd been driving was. I've been debating on sharing this story with anyone outside of my small circle of people that were there. But I want to share my experience in hopes that it saves someone's life or to give understanding of what someone else has experienced. Late fall 2010, in northern Canada, I was deep in the wilderness with my father and my eldest brother to hunt for moose. We left in the early morning, just before sunrise trying to cover as much distance as possible before nightfall. We traveled winding rivers and had to repeatedly portage over rapids all day. We tried to set up camp just over halfway to our destination. My father figured that we'd make the rest of the journey tomorrow. Well, when everyone bedded down for the night, I decided to grab some firewood and relieve myself down by the bank of the river just out of reach of the light from the campfire. Out from the tree line, about 15 yards away, I could hear rustling in the bushes. I watched the area where I heard the noise and focused on that spot. I felt kind of funny, dizzy and lightheaded, and I could smell the putrid stink like old milk or rotten food. Then I saw the trees start to morph and move ever so slightly and begin to take the shape of a head and slight facial features. My eyes began to adjust to the darkness, and along the tree line, I could hear this voice coming from there. I recognized it. The voice sounded like one of my relatives who had recently passed. The face took shape of my relative. Hello? They said, I've missed you. Come see me. I smiled and stepped forward a bit, but stopped 
to analyze the situation. My relative's face stopped smiling and became emotionless. The skin began to turn pale and peel away. Chunks of flesh from their cheeks began to fall away, and I felt shock and fear overwhelm my body. I couldn't make sense of it at all, so I started to back away and make my way towards camp. I didn't realize at the time that I had been walking towards this voice, and I was further away from the firelight. The voice became angry and began shouting at me to, Come here! So I turned to run away. But as soon as I looked back one more time, I saw the most disgusting thing I had ever seen. It was rotting flesh on gnawed bone, caved in eyes, and a hollow chest cavity. This humanoid creature was tall and super thin. I ran as fast as I could, trying to yell for help, but the fear had made my voice quiet and raspy. I ran along the riverbank, and I could hear the heavy breath of the stomping feet from this thing right behind me. I made it onto the top of the riverbank, but it grabbed a hold of my leg as I jumped up. I gripped and tore the grass, trying to lift myself, and yelled as loud as I could. Then finally, my voice came back, and I yelled that, Someone has my leg! My brother woke up and ran over to where I was. Then... He pulled me up and took me over to the fire. I was terrified, trying to explain what I saw and that it looked like my relative, but not. I was trying to convince them that I was not seeing things. But my brother nodded his head and said, I saw it too, I know. Then solidified it. He acknowledged that it was real. We stayed up all night after that, rifles loaded and close by. We packed up when the sun was coming up and went back home. We haven't shared this story with anyone out of fear of being labeled as crazy or liars. I've had nightmares and couldn't sleep for months afterwards. I would see things, dark figures, looking into my window or hear whispers when I was walking home at night. Eventually, I was seeing this dark figure daily. I went to medicine men or shaman for help, but I've learned that the ceremonies only relived it temporarily. Friends have given me everything from protection pouches to certain crystals. I found out that there's a strong possibility that I encountered a Wendigo. I learned that if you encounter one and survive, it attaches itself to you like a parasite. I learned that it could only do this if it touches you, which it did. Ever since that night, I've been on edge when I enter any forest or wooded area, which sucks because I loved being outdoors and hunting and in nature. Now, I always feel like I need to keep my back against something when I'm out in the wild. Anyways, make your own conclusions about this. I've paid a price for being an ignorant child to the stories of old. They are real. I can attest to that. Stay safe, everyone. This happened way back in 2013, when I was in junior college. It was our college organization's annual art camp. For a short description, we're all in fine arts department, and our organization holds this art camp where there are seminars from our professors and mentors, and all in all, team building activities. It's usually set in recreational venues. As I've said earlier, I was in junior, and it was our year as the officers of the said organization. So we were the ones who chose the venue, planned the games, itineraries, and such. To give a brief description of the place, it's in the rural area, around Laguna in the Philippines. It's a huge recreational area with hanging bridges leading to the campfire, a pool area, and obstacle courses. In the middle of the venue, there's a huge open space, function hall, where the seminars were held. Our cabins were hidden by trees located far behind the hall. 
The first cabin was for the mentors and professors. The second was for the girls in my year and co-officers. The third was the sophomores and freshmen. The fourth was for the guys in my year and some freshmen. And the last two cabins were occupied by the higher year students. On the right side of the function hall, there's an outdoor lounge with a life-size chess board game. If you walk straight further, there's the obstacle course area. Further from it was a pool and the foresty area where the campfire and hanging bridge was located. This particular story was experienced by my classmates. It was already night at around 8 p.m. Our scheduled seminar was already finished and everyone was done with their dinner. Some of the students were chilling in the patio of our cabin. Some are walking around and us, the officers, were busy with planning tomorrow's activities. The guys, we're going to name them Gab, Wally, Kev, Alan, and Hero, were chatting and chilling inside their cabin. One of them decided to explore around. Hero told them to go and play at the chessboard area. They decided to go out, except for one. Gab approached Frank, a freshman by the way, dozing at the top bunk. He asked if he wanted to come with him, but Frank was sleepy and he said no to them, turning his back against them. Before leaving, Gab asked Frank if it's all right to borrow his slippers because he had none, and Frank signaled okay. So the five guys were heading out the cabin, fooling around and laughing. They looked around and saw students slowly heading to each cabin to rest. They were almost a few yards away from the chessboard when Gab noticed someone was walking parallel to them. The guy was heading to the large old coconut tree adjacent to the chessboard area. He was confused and stopped walking. Wally, Kev, Alan, and Hero noticed the guy walking as well. It was already dark around with minimal light far from them. Gab tried to rub his eyes and recognize the walking guy. It was Frank. They all shouted, Frank, come here. Hero realized Frank stopped walking and turned to them. No expression at all. Alan was confused as well and asked if it was really Frank. Gab realized something really creepy and faced the guys. <laughs> how, how could it be Frank when I'm wearing his only slippers? He mumbled nervously. They all looked at the guy they were calling earlier and noticed it continued walking and then suddenly disappeared behind the old tall coconut tree. The guys collectively gasped, run, and shouted loudly back to their cabin. When they reached the door, Wally opened it only to find out Frank was sleeping deeply with his headphones on. They woke him up, slapped him softly, and asked him if he's okay or if he had been outside walking around. Frank, rubbing his eyes open, saying no confusingly. The five guys got scared so much they tried to outrun each other, heading to our cab, telling us what happened. I was so scared, but not actually surprised since I felt creepy around the area during the nighttime. It felt really strange and off. I had my experience the night before, but I was not sure if it was paranormal. I was the only one awake at that time. It was 2 a.m., and I hear giggling around our cabin, like kids running around chasing each other. I also noticed silhouettes walking past our screen door, though I personally tried to dismiss it and think of it as some of these students were still awake, fooling around outside. But I wasn't able to sleep until 5 a.m. I believe that place had ghosts and elements in it as per the recount of some of the students as well. You can easily tell if there's something creepy about a place just by the feel it gives off. I recently received a friend request that reminded me of a story, so I'm going to share it with you. This happened after I went to university, so I was 18. I made an effort to make friends after I moved on to campus and ended up with a few groups to hang out with. 
including a new girlfriend and plenty of people from the classes that I liked well enough. There was one class before lunch when it was traditional for people to go to the cafeteria afterwards to eat in pairs or in threes. I wasn't very discerning about who I had lunch with because I got on fine with most people from the class and we were all trying to make an effort to be social. So when one girl, Lily, asked if I wanted to eat lunch together after that class, I didn't have any reasons not to go. We talked about school and that kind of thing. Nothing noteworthy, but she did ask me to go get lunch with her again the next week. It became a pattern, and there wasn't exactly a way to start saying no suddenly. It was fine, but I did mean I lost the chance to eat lunch with anyone else on those days. In hindsight, I suppose that was the point. One day in class, I asked someone if I could add them on social media. This happened in front of Lily. I saw her face jerk towards me from a couple of seats over. It was such a sharp reaction that it was hard to ignore, and I still remember it. By the time I got home later that day, Lily had sent me a friend request. No friends in common. Don't know how she knew my last name. I was a bit surprised, but I guess she just dug through the university's social media pages and found me through there. It gave me a bad feeling, but surely it was fine, I think. Anyway, she ended up messaging me a lot and commenting on anything I posted. I told myself that she was just awkward and we became friends, if not close. I'd known worse people. She still always got me to go eat lunch with her after our one shared class together. Other than that, we rarely spent time together in person. I saw her around sometimes, but I never went out of my way to hang out with her. So it was mostly online messaging and seeing each other in group settings. Coincidentally, my girlfriend was also called Lily. This was something that clearly bothered Lily not my girlfriend, who couldn't have found it less interesting. It's a common name. She occasionally hinted that she wanted my girlfriend to pick a different name or joked about her not suiting it. She clearly didn't like my girlfriend at all, and I had an idea why. It was hard to ignore by this point. Lily was starting to unsubtly hint that she had a crush on me. I tried not to address it because what was I going to say? I've never known what to do when a friend makes a pass at me. I was also not interested in the least. Even ignoring the weird stuff she pulled, Lily was not my type at all. She tended to dress and act in a way somewhere between a 50s housewife and one of those adults who is still obsessed with Disney princesses, if you can picture that. Things took an uncomfortable turn on the day of our last shared class of the year. Instead of asking me to lunch like she usually did, Lily asked if I'd go for a walk with her. Again, I didn't exactly know how to refuse, so I just said all right. Our campus was bordered by a large patch of woodland. Lily led me into the woods, and the sounds of our fellow students slowly faded away. She sat down on a log, and I joined her. She started talking about how she was going to miss me over the summer. I tried placating her, but I didn't want to be there, especially because she seemed almost on the verge of tears. I think I tried to make an excuse about having plans with my girlfriend, but before I could leave, Lily chose to kiss me without warning. It was very uncomfortable to say the least. I got out of there and was happy to think I would never see her for a while. I came back to university after the summer, moving into a house with my friends. Without going off topic, there were some serious issues in my friend group. A lot of petty arguing and worse. I broke up with my girlfriend around the start of that school year as well. And basically the whole mess made me recontextualize things with Lily because it suddenly didn't seem as bad. That said, I didn't want to be alone with her. We mostly talked online. 
She was still constantly messaging me, after all. One upside of everything was that I started dating a boy. Lily was not pleased to hear that news. I think she hoped to sneak in after I broke up with my girlfriend, but as I said before, that was never going to happen. There wasn't a big gap between my breakup and this new relationship, so she must have thought she missed her chance to be with me. This is where the story gets bad. At this time, I was fairly active on Tumblr. I occasionally talked about my life and mostly reblogged photos and stuff. I was on there one day when something odd happened. One of the blogs I followed had received an ask with some phrases I recognized. It took a second to register that it was taken from my about page. That made me freeze. I read the message properly. Someone was asking this completely random person to analyze a section of text from my page, asking for their opinion on the type of person who would write it. I could not stress how messed up it was to see people talking about me like I was a character in a book they were trying to study. The reply was basically, I don't know, sorry. But the important thing was that the question hadn't been anonymous. It linked to someone's blog. Obviously, I wanted to know who had taken such a bizarre interest in me. As far as I knew, no one in real life, other than my boyfriend, knew about my page. Well, no prizes for guessing who was behind it. What I found was like a shrine. She was using a fake name, and I recognized Lily all over that thing. It was this cutesy pink and red page. There were a few posts about her interests, but most of the content was focused on her primary interest, me. Most of the posts were about me. There were accounts of things I'd done recently. He told me about such and such. He went to a nightclub recently, etc. As well as references to things from as far back as I had known her. It was clear she'd been keeping tabs on me, both online and offline, gathering up every scrap of information she could about my life and hoarding it here in her collection. She talked about us eating lunch together and how special our date had been to her, as if it was anything more than acquaintances getting food after class. She talked about the time she had forcibly kissed me in the woods, but she wrote it as if it had been mutual. She quoted lyrics from my favorite song and talked about how she'd always be there for me, no matter who else came into my life. Lots of references to loving me, just the way he is, which answered another mystery about an anonymous love letter I'd received earlier that year with the same wording. Oh, it got worse. There were a lot of posts about my boyfriend as well. These weren't so nice. They got vicious talking about how he didn't deserve me. He didn't know what he had. If she was with me, she'd be jealous of anyone else who came near me. So my boyfriend, not being a jealous person, meant he didn't love me. It was angry and hateful. I didn't like to think about that sort of person who could write so obsessively being fixated on me. One thing that didn't make sense at first was that the blog also made plenty of references to Lily's best friend, Stephen. She had never mentioned this to me. Her posts talked a lot about Stephen and how great of a friend he was and how much fun they had had together, how he looked out for her, etc. I was trying to work out whether this was an online friend when one specific post made it all click. She had posted a photo and captioned it with, Stephen sent this to me. He knew I would like it, and I love it, or something like that. The problem was, the photo was taken from my own page. I hadn't sent it to her. She took it from my page, and then claimed this fictional best friend of hers shared it with her, because in her head... She'd split me into two people. In her messed up fantasy life, 
I was both the perfect best friend who was always looking out for her and her soulmate who was bound to end up with her. When I finally got over my, sweet and kind by the way, boyfriend and all the other easy girls I hung out with that she made dozens of posts complaining about, who was she complaining to? Oh, Lily had an audience. She asked open questions about me and her relationship with me and got messages back from her followers. People who took what she said at face value. I saw a bunch of random people agreeing with the stalker that my boyfriend didn't deserve me. And we were bound to break up soon so I could be with Lily. The person I was clearly supposed to be with. She had this fake fan fiction version of my life up for anyone to share their opinion on. And she'd made herself out to be the hero of it all. I went maybe a month back into this page's history. I did not look at everything that was there. It was too much. So I'm not sure how long this had been going on. I sent Lily a message confronting her about the blog. She said nothing. And I could not stress how weird it was to have found pages and pages dedicated to me with her talking about how she was in love with me and would make sure we ended up together, slamming my boyfriend and building a fantasy life with two different versions of me in it that she clearly believed to be real, then acting like it hadn't happened. She said nothing. She didn't address it. She just changed the subject, even after I pushed, and was like she hadn't even registered what I said. I've never seen anything else like it. She deleted the page, of course, or at least changed the name and hid it so I would never find it again. It wasn't the end, though. I wasn't going to hang out with her anymore, but we were still shoved together in classes, and she had started to actually scare me with what she might do next. I'm kind of a paranoid person, knowing someone was obsessively keeping track of me for God knows how long that completely freaked me out. The next thing she pulled was trying to seduce my boyfriend. It was an absolutely useless attempt that only made him uncomfortable. He told me about it right away. What was her plan there? Did she hope to tell me he cheated and wait for me to break up with him? Why would I want her after that? When that didn't work out for her, she tried hitting on three of my other friends. None of them took the bait. She ended up dating one of my former housemates for a while, but made sure to send me messages while they were together letting me know she'd rather be with me. No thank you. Lily made sure to stay in my life the whole time I was at university. There was a time when I tried to pull away from her, and she ended up starting rumors about me and damaging a career opportunity I'd put a lot of work into. I don't know what else she did behind my back, but it made me realize it was safer to let her think she was a part of my life while ignoring her, rather than doing something that would cause her to get angry. After I graduated, Lily still wanted to spend time with me. But I knew I didn't have to now. I made excuses about work and barely talked to her after that point. I almost entirely stopped posting on social media that I knew she knew about. Of course, she didn't give up that easily. She tried to start conversations, ask me to meet up with her, attempts I usually ignored. I didn't like to think she was still tracking me online, but she probably was. I don't know how, but she'd occasionally reference things I mentioned online somewhere. Some where she shouldn't have known about. The last time we had a real conversation, she sent me a message out of nowhere. We hadn't spoke at all in months, and we didn't talk about anything serious in much longer than that. Thinking about that conversation still makes my skin crawl. But I'll summarize what happened. At first, she asked me some questions about how long I had known I was gay. I told her some basic stuff, 
the kind of thing I'd tell anyone who asked. Then she changed the subject. She started talking about how would I feel about her if she was a boy, about wanting to be a boy just for me. The messages quickly became fetishistic. She went into plenty of detail about fantasies she had about the two of us. Again, we were not friends at this point. We'd never been especially close, at least not from my perspective. And we had barely spoken for years. I can't imagine sending messages like that to even a close friend, let alone someone who barely knows you. I tried telling her not to pull this crap with me, and she decided to change tactics. She sent photos of herself, followed by a bunch of messages, maybe four or five a minute, way too fast for me to reply before the next one arrived. Basically quoting back what I had told her about myself and my past earlier. She was telling me these things as if they'd happened to her. She was role-playing as me. The worst part was that she seemed to believe it was real, that those things actually happened to her, even when she was quoting me word for word. Things I told her only hours before were now her life. It was like she was trying to absorb my history to take it over, to make my life part of her. Yeah, I didn't talk to her again after that. I ignored future attempts she made to talk to me, and I eventually silently deleted her from the inactive social media, which was her only real way of contacting me. I really thought she might finally move on. A few days ago, she sent me a friend request. It's sitting in the unanswered area, because I know if I delete it, she'll only send another one. Lily and I met nearly 12 years ago. This story is just a highlight. And even then, it's only the stuff I know about for sure. A lot of shit happened behind my back. I know it did. So, girls who spent 12 years obsessing over me, fetishizing me, stalking me and harassing me, let's never meet again. The fantasy life you built for the two of us in your head is the only place you'll be seeing me anytime soon. So today had been a particularly slow day at work, and I've been killing time reading stories on Reddit. Maybe enough time had passed, and I can now share mine. I had this friend who was really into the occult. Unfortunately, I was the one who got him turned on to it. We had a mutual appreciation for the paranormal and all things weird. So I thought the subject would interest him. He started going deep into the subject to the point where he wouldn't talk about anything else. He would actually interrupt a conversation and force the subject back to occult matters. Rude, but sometimes people go through phases with their interests, and all they want is to talk about it. It was mostly just a forgivable occurrence. I think I should mention that this particular friend didn't have a very large friend circle. His depression and introverted nature kept him inside a lot. He didn't have the best of luck in relationships with women. His world was kind of small and I didn't enjoy hanging out with him, so I did my best to be a good friend. I didn't want to just brush him off because he was acting a little weirder than normal. Honestly, for the longest time, he was a totally normal guy. We chat and play games together on the PlayStation. Sometimes we'd even go see movies, with my boyfriend accompanying us. We all hung out at the park. We went swimming. Overall, we just had a good time hanging out. Things started to go downhill when he started to smoke DMT. Personally, I think psychedelics are amazing tools that can offer insight into our life, but they should be treated with respect. My friend got to the point where he was making it himself, apparently a pretty easy thing to do after a meager amount of research, and he was smoking it daily, multiple times a day. For those of you who aren't familiar with the substance, when you smoke it, you get transported to a different world. 
an entirely new plane of existence. Your body and yourself don't exist anymore. You're just exploring this alternative reality dreamscape. My personal experience with it led me to seeing a dragon once in this kaleidoscope of a cornucopia. People see all kinds of different things there. Imagine what that does to a person when they're smoking it 30 plus times in a day. He started telling me things like he was the reincarnated Osiris. He said he was seeing Egyptian hieroglyphics all over the place in waking life. Apparently, he had hour-long conversations with entities in his bedroom, even when he wasn't smoking DMT. Of course, I was very alarmed to hear all of this, and I told him he needed to take a serious break. No drugs at all for a few months so he could find solid footing in reality again. At this point, I was still hanging out with him because he obviously needed my help. And like I said before, he didn't have a lot of friends that could give him that. He was also the black sheep of the family, so I knew he wasn't getting any kind of support from them. He was really close to his sister, however, and I did reach out to her on Facebook to express my concerns. I pushed her to talk him into getting some psychiatric help because he was slipping past the point of no return. I'm not really sure if she took my messages seriously, since we didn't really know each other. Plus, she is at least six years younger than us, and possibly didn't grasp how serious the situation was becoming. In any case, I'll jump forward now to the part where things start to get really creepy. My boyfriend had made arrangements to hang out with our friend at the park. I didn't really want to go because I felt like I needed a break from him and his nonsensical ranting. I just couldn't deal with it on that particular day. My boyfriend said he wasn't all that bad and we went anyway. We get to the park and he is his usual self, ranting about Egypt and made up gods that only he knew the truth about, etc. He also had this large hunting knife that he kept fiddling with the whole time we were there on a walk. He told us that he had been using it in ceremonial magic and that it helped to banish negative thoughts. It made me extremely uneasy. He would do this thing where he would take the knife and make stabbing motions near his heart or head, like he was mock stabbing himself all while holding a conversation with me or my boyfriend. I think we were both really on edge and didn't know how or what to say or do about it. I tried to distract him from doing it by bringing up other subjects that might interest him, but he kept on with this ritual. Keep in mind, we were walking on a trail, so it wasn't like we could just say goodbye then and there. We had to walk back to our car and drop him off at his car. My boyfriend had the bright idea that we should get some lunch after our walk, even though I was doing my best to give him a look that said, No, you crazy fuck. Why would you think I want to spend any more time with this nut? But it must not have been very effective, or my boyfriend was ignoring it. Not sure. Anyway... We ended up getting in the car to go get lunch. In the car I was driving, my boyfriend was in the passenger seat, and our weird old friend was in the back. As we're heading through a busy part of town where all the shopping and restaurants are, I hear the distinctive sound of a belt buckle coming undone. Then I hear the worst sound imaginable. I peek back out of the corner of my eye, and my suspicions were confirmed. This crazy fucker was full-on jacking off in our back seat. I mean, pants down all the way, bare ass on the seat, beating it so hard it was like he wanted to rip it off. Instantly, I felt sick to my stomach and all the nervous energy I had throughout the day popped up into my head. I was trying not to shake and trying to ignore it and drive through heavy traffic. I kind of had a freeze response, I guess. The whole time I kept thinking about that huge-ass knife he had in his pocket 
and obviously he was completely off his rocker now. I was afraid to say anything or confront him because I didn't know how he was going to react. This part is nuts, but my boyfriend didn't fucking seem to notice, and the whole time he kept rambling on about God knows what. I couldn't listen because my thoughts were 100% focused on driving and trying to act like I don't know what was going on in the back seat. We get to the restaurant and my boyfriend runs inside to grab food. I'm left alone in the car with our friend and I try to act like I'm browsing on my phone when really I'm watching and listening as hard as I can. We didn't talk. My boyfriend gets back and I complain that I'm tired. It's been a long day. Let's drop him off, etc. So I drive us back to our friend's car and he doesn't get out of our vehicle. He just sits there. I have to get a little bit rude and ask him to please get the hell out and go home. He gets out of our car and walks over to his passenger side. I start getting really scared and I suspected the worst. He pulled a gun out of some kind of his bag he had on the seat and he just walks over to our car with it. I don't know why the fuck I did this, but I was so pissed I just got out of my car and walked right up to him. I was maybe three feet away and could see it was a loaded 9mm. I kept asking him over and over, What are you doing? Because apparently that's all my brain could think to do. I told him to get in his car and go home. He never said anything during this whole time just kind of cried and had this wild look in his eyes. For whatever reason, he got back into his car and drove off. I told my boyfriend, obviously, we are never hanging out with him again, and that I didn't even want to talk to him anymore. No contact. Nada. A few months pass, and he occasionally messages me through the PlayStation or texts my phone. He says a lot of random shit and I just ignore it. It turns out he moved down to Tennessee near Nashville. I don't know why. He had a roommate and I think their girlfriend lived there. I don't know. I'm not really sure about the situation. I honestly really don't care. I think maybe he's turning his life around and getting a fresh start down there. I think it's best to cut all contact and let him regroup. I'm not interested in any kind of friendship with him, and I know he needed help beyond what I could offer. Again, I reached out to his sister and let her know that he had a gun. She managed to get it from him somehow, but it did little good in the end. I got a call at around 11 p.m. one night. That wakes me up. It's a man claiming he's a detective down in Gatlin, Tennessee, and my heart skips a beat. I start sweating and immediately ask what happened. Apparently, my former friend stabbed someone to death on Halloween Day. I don't know all the details, and the articles about it are kind of sparse. The whole thing is really surreal, and I'm just left feeling like I'm lucky that I didn't get shot last summer. This whole thing turned out way longer than I meant it to be, but that's the story. I'm still feeling creeped out by the whole ordeal, and I'm kind of feeling sick after writing all of this down. But unfortunately, that was my story. Stay safe out there, everyone. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true entwined horror stories. And may I remind you, this is only Volume 1. I'd like to take a moment and give a very special shout-out to the Reformed members of Back to Ashes. Mrs. Innerscare, Tina Mead, Colton Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank you all for your membership and showing Back to Ashes nothing but love. I appreciate each and every last one of you. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time.
Please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. And as always, peace, love, and light to you all.